Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to say hello and welcome to the first ever Traxo Travel Manager Town Hall. And most of you joining the call today have been to numerous, perhaps countless webinars since the rise of the global pandemic. You know, most of which, including our office hour series, have been di designed as panelist discussions to give valuable information and helpful tips with the ability for questions to be asked via Q&A chat functions. We decided to take a bit of a different direction this month based on feedback we've heard from you. Uh, since we began our office hour series, we've surveyed and to ask your top interests after each webinar and at the top of the list consistently was interest in hearing more from other travel managers and travel buyers about their best practices learned. So we thought it would be a good idea to give you the floor and provide an open format for you to share what you've learned and ask questions on topics you may want to learn from others. But for those of you not too familiar with what we do at Traxo, the benefits can be summed up in three words, data, visibility, and control. Medium and large enterprises use us to eliminate their corporate travel blind spots, also known as booking leakage, by automatically aggregating all corporate travel activity, whether booked through their TMC, direct with suppliers, through an OTA site, or any other method in one place in real time. If you'd like to learn more about how we accomplish this and explore the benefits of being able to receive complete itinerary intelligence in real time from your business travelers, we'll provide an opportunity for you to connect with us at the end of this webinar. This office hours webinar is part of a series to help corporate travel managers down this path so they can turn their own travel programs into a strategic asset for their company. A bit of housekeeping before we begin. This webinar is being recorded, so you'll be able to view it again if you enjoyed it or would like to share it with someone you feel may be interested. To view the recording of this and past webinars, please visit resources.traxo.com. And as I mentioned, there will be no panelists here today as this is designed for your voice to be heard. We do have a chat feature you can use to share thoughts or ask questions, but we encourage you to talk with the rest of the group and engage, unmuting your line when you have something to share, then muting once you're done speaking. Please be respectful of each, <clears throat> excuse me, please be respectful of each other and keep your line muted until you have something to share. And we want to give as many as possible the opportunity to share your thoughts, but we also ask that you be mindful. We have set an hour for this call, so please keep your comments or questions at a reasonable length to allow others to chime in as well. Please keep all comments and questions professional and positive. Be mindful not to share anything that you would not feel comfortable uh, being shared in a public forum. You know, for example, an email address or phone number. We're happy to facilitate connections privately if you'd like to reach out to us here at Traxo and we'll provide a means to do so at the end of this call. As a final note, please keep in mind that the opinions and thoughts shared here are from your peers and may not be the best advice for your individual program or situation. We ask that you give the same respect of each other's time and opinions that you would want to receive for yourself. So, now that we've talked through the housekeeping, let's start with a quick poll. Uh, we're curious to know uh, what percentage your organization has resumed travel to date. So I'm gonna turn this over to our Chief Product Officer, Matt Griffin, and he'll start the slide share. Matt, can we hear you? I'm not sure we can hear you. So basically, if you guys want to go to slido.com and enter the, the code 27272, that will take you to the poll. I'm not sure. Oh, you know what? Might be having some technical difficulties. All right. Can I come there you go. go. Yep. Perfect. Yep. Yeah. Visit slido.com and then enter code 27272. Uh, we'll also post a link to this. Uh, in uh, the chat and kind of with that, let's go ahead and get the poll started. I'll go ahead and activate the poll. So the first question uh, is what percentage of your travel program has resumed to date? Uh, all right, wow, questions or answers are, are flooding in. Fantastic. Uh, right, keep them coming. Yeah. Okay, so while everyone is, um, uh, is voting, I'm gonna go ahead and open the floor. So feel free on the, if, if you, at the bottom of your screen, there should be a, an icon that says participants. If you click that, you should see all of your uh, participants that are in the room with you. If you click next to your name, you should be able to unmute your line. So I did bring some, some pre-planned questions for you guys, but this really is a forum for you to talk. Uh, so I'd love to hear from you. Let's start with maybe uh, uh, anyone that's willing to speak up, uh, unmute your line. Uh, happy to see you on video too. We'd love to see your smiling face. We wanna make this as close to the, to being together in person as possible. So uh, what are you doing today 
and your program to keep your travelers safe. Curious to know, any thoughts, any ideas from any of you? Um, our company put together some PPE kits our travelers can order if they, if they want to go on travel. It includes a face shield, a, a mask, wipes, hand sanitizer, you know, all the stuff. But we're only doing about 10% mission, just any mission critical trips right now. Gotcha. Fantastic. Thank you. Anybody else? Anything else you're doing uh, to keep your travelers safe? Justin, we put out with our legal department, our risk and human resources, about a 70 page uh, pandemic response manual. So it doesn't just go for COVID, but it's something that we finally had to address. And then I came in with legal and communications and I wrote a two page travel addendum for our people that are traveling, basically to tell them what they're supposed to take, what they're supposed to look for, what to expect when they're traveling with hotels, with housekeeping, anything that a traveler might possibly be concerned about or not understand, that way they go in prepared before they travel. And we're um, pretty much just doing techs and trucking people to fix machines. So we are by far less than probably even 10% of our travel. Wow, 70 pages, so some light reading for your employees. It has pictures too for those that don't <laughs> like to read. So it's pretty simple. Excellent, excellent. Um, so it looks like the, everybody's pretty much done answering the poll. So 73% of you said that travel is resumed up to about 20, anywhere from nothing to 25%. Um, and it looks like 20% of you are 0%. And then a small portion of you are, are, are getting back on the road more regularly. Appreciate that, guys. Thank you. Um, Anybody else? Anybody else want to share, you know, kind of what you've been doing to keep your employees safe? Uh, well, we have a COVID uh, website that's uh, it's it's a cross-functional working group that we use between HR, um, marketing, uh, have travel security, health and safety. So it's it's and risk management. So we have. Um, a group of folks that we put out communications. It starts from the top down from our CEO, uh, just keeping everyone informed. We also have travel FAQs. Now we are on that zero to 25% um, slate there where only our very essential travelers are traveling. And it also has to have a divisional lead or divisional head approval. So um, with that, uh, and then we also have FAQs, you know, what would happen if you got sick while traveling or what were the protocols. Uh, also, we're checking in with our hotels, doing a audit of who's open and who's not and making sure that travelers are aware of that and working with our teams um, and our global account managers from a supplier standpoint on uh, what properties are available, you know, to our travelers for mm -hmm. certain projects. So we're doing a number of things. That's great, Carmen. Thanks for that. Um, how about this? What is your biggest challenge right now? Anybody, anybody that wants to share, what's keeping you up at night right now with your, with your travel program? So I'll go ahead and go on that one. Um, I'm Holly McTigg with Halliburton and I think the thing that's keeping me up most at night is there is such different realities depending on the regions our travelers will be going to and even further still the different counties and districts within those regions just making sure that we're providing the most up-to-date information that, that single source of truth if you will yeah you know i heard somebody ask um, on one of the forums you know how do you control the information that your employees receive so there are all of these different sources and places that your employees can go to receive communications, but then you have the communication that you as a, as a company want your employees to have. So how do you regulate that? How do you make sure that what's in front of them is what you want them to hear and what you want them to see? Any thoughts on that? I mean, for yeah. our program, we're still working through it. I mean, we have, and it sounds like a couple others on the call have designed sites that are general repositories of where people can go. But what we're finding is while the information is on these sites, it's maybe not, uh, it's changing rapidly. So it's hard to, to stay up 
on top of it if you're a traveler or travel arranger, and also it's a little bit difficult to sort. Makes sense. Makes sense. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? The communication? Yes, uh, TMC has come up with uh, a few websites which are updated daily that um, give a lot of information, including what, what uh, if you're talking about domestic travel in whatever country, where you can go from one state, from one province to another, which is helping, not to mention the visa and the access and everything else, and it has helped people a lot. Good point. Good point, Ruth. Thank you. Um, so, you know, I mean, uh, what we really wanted to do when we put this together is we wanted to get you guys in a room. And I don't know if you've ever had, uh, you know, in the back of your mind as you're going through your day to day, I, gee, I wonder how other people in my position are doing this. And I don't know what those questions would be. Um, but I'd like to leave that up to you guys. I'm, I'm kind of hoping to maybe even just take a back seat and let you just talk to each other. Uh, so is there anybody on here that has that, you know, hey, what are you doing to X or Y or Z or whatever it is? Um, any thoughts from anybody? Hi, Justin. This is Ann Derry from S&P Global. Um, I was definitely in that position a couple of months ago because I, for whatever reason, I guess listening to all these different webinars, I had the impression that a lot of my peers we're farther ahead than I was and our company was in developing a return to travel framework and process. So I got uh, to work and created a task force that had a travel team, clients, et cetera. And we actually drafted our own framework as well as a very detailed uh, pre-trip approval form um, that we created outside of our travel agency because we wanted to make sure that it was applicable globally. And then in countries where the form can't leave the country like China or Russia, Israel, um, that we didn't run into any compliance issues and data security issues there. But I know some of my colleagues have reached out to me uh, because we already have this framework and the form in place. So if anyone needs any assistance with building that out, I suggest they want to start with the road framework, which is, it's very detailed. It's, it's really an exercise. Um, for almost like a group activity to kind of flush out how best to approach um, the return to travel with your respective companies. So I'm curious, Anne, on that, um, how do you implement a pre-trip approval process outside of your TMC? You know, for those of, that aren't using a TMC, how are you managing that? Well, the way we're managing it is that I'm working basically in lockstep with our regional corporate communication directors. Every time a region and or country starts to live, a very detailed process of communications that go directly to the employee, the leadership, then the employees. I'm also part of multiple different working groups of our business divisions. So as you can imagine, my day starts really early <laughs> with these calls mm -hmm. that are going on around the world. Um, but it really is about working very closely. If, if you have a corporate communications team, I suggest you work very closely with them uh, because there are employee communications. Within our communications, we hyperlink everything back to our microsites, our COVID-19 microsites on our internal hub. So there's a travel microsite, a security microsite, there's the enterprise-wide microsite. And all of these sites, they all align, they connect to each other. Um, so it is a, it's, it's a huge communication effort. And then uh, for the most part, security and I are doing these virtual roadshows and speaking directly to various groups of travelers, stakeholders, business divisions, whatever it may be, um, explaining to them how this process is going to work. What we're finding now, though, is that we have very limited travel basically outside of China, for instance. There's, there's some domestic travel going on there, but there are a lot of situations in which locally our office may just be transitioning to that wave one uh, going back to the office, which means we have a very limited amount of employees in the office, perhaps not even 10% are in the office. But um, there are many external meetings that are being requested by our clients and or regulators, et cetera. And how do we handle those external meetings if that particular employee is returning back to the office in one of the split teams? So those are the type of complexities that have started to surface. and. Um, we actually had to recently change up our approval process because when it comes to an external meeting, 
not only does that need to approve, but we really need the local commercial officer to approve as well to make sure that that meeting meets our essential travel definition, even if it's just local. Um, I'd like to add to Ann, what Ann has just said, because we also provided a uh, proposed project plan return to travel uh, to our leadership team. Of course, with everything changing and as fluid as uh, everything is, some of that is, you know, still on hold. Um, and with the, still with the reduction of travel, which is probably 95% or 90, even 99% of our travel is still on hold, except for those project teams. And, uh, you know, to the same point that Ann has made, you know, we are working with our different projects and programs on, you know, what is allowed uh, external travel. You know, we do have uh, customers that may or may not want us on site uh, as a result of, of COVID. So things are changing, uh, you know, for us, but we have presented a plan. And uh, again, we probably have to update that plan. Um, Pre-approval has been uh, in place. Uh, we're putting that in place now because we originally were a non-mandated program. We are since a mandated program, number one for duty of care, uh, because of having to move travelers from different locations when they were stuck uh, due to COVID and the borders closed and just the different laws that are going on globally that we have offices around the world. So we have to also keep those things in mind. U.S. travelers not being able to travel most places because we're banned. Uh, so just the logistics of all of that. Um, so we, you know, it's, it, it is a, a fluid situation but we are taking it um, with stride. And again, the communication, working with the groups, uh, making sure that um, everyone is communicated with. Our online booking tool has you know, messaging there that states that you have to have divisional level lead uh, approval in order to travel. Uh, our agent team knows that they can't book travel without that divisional lead. And so there are some things that we are working out from a mandated uh, standpoint that we have not worked out before uh, because we were uh, allowing our travelers to book outside of our, our program. So how's that going? Is it, is it rolling out pretty well, you think? I mean, obviously you said you haven't really gotten back out there yet, but curious um, to know. You know, it, you know the, the thing that has come out of this, Justin, for me, and I, I would say there's always a silver lining in any of these situations, but for us, the communication throughout our company, we are a very diverse, ICF is a very diverse company. Uh, we're a consulting firm, but we do anything from, um, you know, dis disaster relief management to human trafficking prevention, uh, to archae we have archaeologists on staff with uh, you know historical preservation type stuff aviation so we are very very diverse and the one thing that has come out of it is the communication and the coordination and the collaboration with all of these different uh, verticals within our company and it has allowed them to number one see the value of travel number two understand the, the policies and the things that maybe they haven't paid attention to, and also knowing that they have to get that divisional level lead. So it, it has put us in the forefront, uh, mm -hmm. more importantly, and uh, has kind of funneled everything through travel and, and allowed us to educate our travelers uh, in, in a way that we have not been able to do historically. Thanks for that, Carmen. So I'm curious for anybody else, um, do any of the rest of you have a program where it was pretty open and now you've decided to restrict and you've made, uh, you've maybe instituted pre-trip approvals or a heavily mandated program, whereas before you didn't? Uh, curious to hear from anyone else on here that, that's gone a new direction in that way and, and how it's going for anyone Justin, who's open to sharing. We have. Um, so Leggett has. So what they did was the top four people of the company, so our CEO, COO, CFO, and then another one of our presidents, they have to approve all travel. So that means even from the truck drivers, it doesn't matter who you are, it has to be approved by them. So they have to make sure it's an, a necessary trip. And we even put that in on Concur for those that book online, it prompts them and they can only get to a certain point 
and they have to click which one of those people approve the trips. So it does make people stop and hesitate before they try to book any travel so that they know that, that somebody's going to get a report. That, that sounds so insane though, Tracy, and I appreciate you sharing that, but how do they manage that? I mean, especially you don't as have it much to travel. pick up. It, okay. It's really not that big of a deal because what they're trying to do is they're trying to discourage travel. They're trying to wait and see how we're going to go gotcha. through this. Plus with flu season, so they're a little concerned with everything right, right. now. And right. We have, we're global, right? So we have so many locations in China all around the world and we're not traveling out. So it's strictly in the US. I think we have some Mexico, a little bit of Canada, not much inner Canada. So people know that they're not to travel. Everyone's trying to do everything online that they possibly can other than our truck drivers and our techs. Mm -hmm. Salespeople are not out. Makes sense. So uh, here's a, here's a question and one that's come up. So I've heard uh, from some of the other webinars that have been on that uh, with the slowdown in travel, that, that a lot of organizations are taking this opportunity to revamp their program, to just do something completely different or completely new, or, you know, they might be shopping their TMC or they might be, uh, you know, going out to bid for new suppliers um or any anything i mean I, i'd love to hear from anybody here have, have you decided to rehaul your program or take a a fresh look or fresh perspective over something that you that you've not done before because now you've got a little bit of you know downtime from from covid anybody yeah I'll, I'll actually, oh, sorry go ahead no that's okay go ahead we actually um just implemented a, a new uh, signed with a new TMC and actually revamped a lot of things have changed. We were actually a um, traditional uh, rent to plate type department within our company. And because of COVID, we've lost, you know, some of our team members, unfortunately. And so we've actually had to revamp. We had, we had planned, already had planned to move to a different TMC. And because they're pretty great with, you know, the technology that they offer, us, we were, we're thankful that we actually have them now. And it seems to be going really well. Um, people are adapting, you know, as Tracy mentioned, because I'm with Leggett as well. Um, you know, our concur site, you know, people are, they do have to select that person, you know, whoever's approved their travel. So it is, people are kind of afraid and, you know, does that send a note or, you know, what, what does that do? So they're reaching out to us asking questions, but I think, you know, with travel being as low as it is, it'll be easier, you know, an easier transition for people, you know, because of the situation too, so. Yeah, thanks for that, Stephanie. Um, that is a quite a change. The route from rent a plate where they're, you know, it's full service, everything on, and then switching over to, you know, a TMC with a online booking tool. And I can only imagine how fun that's gonna be when travel starts to pick up. Anybody else? Anybody else uh, undergoing a, a big change in your organization with regards to travel? Yeah, I was just going to take that question from a different perspective. Um, due to this pause, our company has started looking at a net zero initiative when it comes to sustainability. So the travel program obviously is high up there on the list of um, functions that contributes quite a bit to our emissions footprint globally. So. Uh, due to this sustainability program, that will also affect what our will look like post-COVID because most likely any sort of short duration domestic or international trips are going to be prohibited. Um, we've obviously been doing quite well in this virtual environment, um, you know, and I think our program will become much more of a hybrid program between uh, actual traditional travel and um, pushing some of that travel to a virtual environment if it meets certain criteria that align with our new sustainability program that will be coming out next year. Good so point, somewhat along those lines, one thing that we're looking at because our group used to have the meetings team under our umbrella and after COVID um, that group was dissolved because we were no longer doing in-person meetings, but now we're at a point where we're looking at how we are um, administering virtual meetings and what performance metrics are needed under virtual meetings and then how many are in the pipe right now because we've already caught where a couple different groups have outsourced some of this because they didn't even know we had any registration technologies that we could repurpose and so 
um, by default, we're having to wrap our arms around what that new need looks like and how many bodies and how many you know, labor hours we'll need to fulfill that. So I'd be kind of curious if anybody else on the call has also had that kind of fall in their lap <laughs> during this whole COVID transition that we're in. Come on, don't be shy, guys. I've talked to a lot of you on this call that are being quiet. <laughs> I know you're not. <laughs> Anybody, anybody struggling with that, uh, that same challenge that Holly's going through? Thanks for bringing that up, Holly. You know, the, the meeting technology, it's not something that uh, you could have predicted in 2019. You know, it's, it, it's it definitely a new consideration for sure. Well, and when we put it in place forever ago, it was more for basic registrations for in-person, but now we're having to look at capacity controls, um, you know, uh, concurrent tracks, you know, internal and external, how those links will get administered. And so, you know, when you had a group that was the expert at that and then they dissolved, we're learning quickly. But um, if anybody reflects on it or finds out another group in their companies is working on that as well, I would love some best practice sharing at a later time if anybody has it. It's excellent. That is exactly the reason why we wanted to put this together. Um, so you definitely have a good forum to ask that question. If anybody wants to speak up, feel free. This is um, it's, it's not necessarily specific to virtual meetings, but um, Troop Travel's a, um, a platform for um, finding out where to meet, maybe new local meetings as we restart meetings. Um, and it has all the COVID and safety c c built into it. So you can arrange a safe meet or a safer meeting as you can, as we sort of return to sort of local meetings and, and then scale up back to, to global meetings. That's the only, only thing I'm aware of. Thanks, Spencer. And uh, if you wanna, um, if you care to share a link in the chat, feel free. Well done, um, thanks. Yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing. Anybody else, any other changes with your program as a result of the, uh, the slowdown or the, the break from in-person travel? Justin, I might like to speak up. Good morning, all. My name is Steve Mitleider, and I lead the travel and meetings program for the University of Chicago. Um, I hope you're all well and that your families and loved ones are well also. Uh, I'd like to back up to your question about what keeps me awake at night. Aside from the fact that I'm an old man and just don't sleep too well, um, uh, from a mega uh, standpoint, uh, what troubles me uh, a lot is the sustainability of our supply base. Uh, here we are almost in October with a government deadlocked in terms of providing perhaps uh, support for a CARES 2 Act with financial relief specifically uh, in part uh, intended for our U.S.-based airline industry. Uh, I believe current CARES funding runs out at the end of October and were there not another uh, funding approved by um, Congress and the President, uh, tens of thousands of people uh, are absolutely to be laid off. Uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands, of hotels around the country and here in Chicago that have been closed, just closed. Hotels that have been open and functioning for decades are closed with staff either furloughed or laid off. Um, so I don't know in my entire lifetime if I've ever scratched my head and wondered, will we have a, a domestic airline industry uh, six months from now, a year from now, that, that thought never even crossed my mind. Um, I believe it's in the national interest of the country to have a sustainable uh, hospitality and travel industry, uh, but I'm genuinely worried about the political infighting um, and the lack of commitment from either party uh, to support uh, our industry. So. You know, we can all worry about uh, our individual agencies, sustainability and, and others, but from a macro perspective, 
uh, I'm, I'm kind of scratching my head. And for me, to your question of are we revamping anything right now? Well, the only instructions I've had from my leadership are go out and find another agency uh, in the event that our travel agency goes belly up. And I don't know any TMC that could sustain its operations given fixed cost um, and 10 to 15 percent demand relative to 2019. So you know what to that point, Steve, uh, and, and thank you for bringing that up. There is a question yeah. in the chat um, that I, it, I think it's a good question, pretty relative to that point about the uh, sustainability of, of our suppliers. So curious to know that the question was posted curious to know if TMCs have started to take travel managers uh, to talk to travel managers about a subscription fee model as opposed to a paper transaction model. Love to hear feedback from you guys on that one. We just signed with a new TMC or actually we signed just implemented like Stephanie mentioned. And uh, now we're doing transaction. Um, and since we just signed a five year contract. We're not that concerned about it, really. Um, they're growing. They're very stable. Um, I feel like we were very careful about how we chose our TMC. If it doesn't work out, uh, Steph and I have been agents for over 30 years. So I'm not too concerned about it. I think that we'll figure something out. Uh, I think it depends on the sort of travel one has. 40% of our travel is uh, client related. Therefore, the clients are paying for the travel. So we go on the basis of transaction charge because of that, because otherwise we are going to pay for something we don't have to. And I doubt if it'll change in the near future. That's an interesting point. Anybody else? Hey, it's Steve from CS. Um, so we, we currently have a transaction model um, with our TMC. But we have been in, in talks with them about how sustainable this is, especially since we're with a, well, they were a smaller TMC, I think now, now they're probably more of a mid-sized TMC. Um, and, and naturally wanting to be good partners, we understand that we were the, the bulk of their business. Um, so when we were talking about it, we came up with two possible solutions and one seems more reasonable than the other. So the first was that we would agree to minimums, meaning that we agree to a minimum number of transactions per year. And if we fall below that, we would, we would end up paying because they, they obviously have a cost of business. Um, but if we exceed it, the, then no, no harm, no foul type of thing, um, which hopefully we would, hopefully we get back to that point where, where that's not even gonna be a, a topic of conversation. The, so that, that's the path that we will likely head down. The second path was, you know, when I think about a TMC, I think about it as, as a bit of a consulting firm of sorts, kind of like us, where you should pay for the time that you take up as opposed to paying for a transaction, which I never really understood, right? Because a very complicated international travel probably takes 45 minutes with loads of back and forth. Um, and a super simple domestic trip can take three minutes. Um, and so I've never really understood why I pay roughly the same amount of money for a very simple domestic trip and a very complicated international trip. Now, I, I'm sure that they've worked out that there's somewhere in the middle that, that that's their sweet spot, right? Um, but it seems to me as though I should pay by the, time, the amount of time that I take up, which is essentially what we do in, in our world uh, as a consulting firm. Uh, so when I brought that to our travel management company, um, which is Lux, they, they said that it, that's very intriguing, but the amount of effort it would take to overhaul their system to implement that is, is probably not going to happen in the near future. Um, but that, that's how they actually view themselves too. And so, you know, maybe it's a future possibility. Um, and then, and then if you think about it, you could say like, well, Hey, I don't, this, this agent isn't, great for international but you know so i want to be charged less um so it could be like a scale of sorts based on who you get in terms of pricing so it's, it's yeah, an and that's a good model, point not, not gonna work. i think um 
you know, now that you've put that out there in the public forum, your phone's probably going to ring off the hook from a bunch of TMCs with that idea. <laughs> it's a good idea. Um, and thank you for that. So, you know, one of the things that we've realized, I think, through all of this is that the only thing that we can expect right now that to, to be constant is change. And I know that's kind of a cliche term, but we are definitely having to adapt to this new environment. And we're curious. We have a, another poll we would like to bring um, around change. You know, so basically, Matt, if you could get that queued up. Um, we're curious on a scale of one to five, how much are you changing your travel program uh, during the lull in business travel brought on by the, the COVID-19 pandemic? So again, it's uh, slido.com with uh, the code 27272. And I'll give you guys a little bit to answer that. So we are, uh, we're about 20 till, so I, I would imagine we're probably gonna give about maybe another five or 10 minutes for questions and we've got some closing comments. Um, anything else, anything else that's, that's on your mind, guys, anything, I mean, this is really your, your forum, your, uh, arena, ask the questions or, you know, if you've had an aha, uh, anything that's come up that you've realized has been really helpful, um, and maybe not even having anything to do with the pandemic, just something with your program that you thought was a, a brilliant way that you've navigated through something or handled something uh, that you'd like to share with the group. Anybody? Um, just to throw one thing out, yesterday uh, we had the news that uh, corporate travel management was acquiring travel and transport and kind of related to the concerns that Stephen brought up around uh, the supply side and what's going to happen with, you know, suppliers, even what's going to happen with, you know, TMCs. Does anyone have any kind of specific concerns around that? Or um, Stephen, it sounds like y'all are coming up with a, uh, a plan B option just in case. Um, but uh, um, I'm just curious if anyone has any kind of reactions to the news yesterday uh, with uh, travel and transport. Well, I have a little reaction because my sister actually works for travel and transport. <laughs> I was one of the oh, few yeah. employees that um, had been uh, like partially furloughed. So she's been waiting to find out what was going to happen with her role. Um, I definitely think the, the CTM acquisition, it, I think it's a great idea. I think it, um, I think it will save travel and transport um, and it'll extend CTM's footprint well into North America. You know, I, I think overall the entire industry is going to change. I think it's going to, uh, there's going to be some of that Pac-Man effect for those of you who are of a certain generation know who Pac-Man are. Pac-Man was, but you know, I think larger companies that are um, carrying a lot less debt are going to be gobbling up the ones that are medium size or smaller that are carrying, uh, carrying quite a lot of debt. Um, I also think getting to the point, I forgot the gentleman's name from the University of Chicago, but you know, the, the entire airline industry is going to shrink. I don't think our legacy carriers are going to disappear per se, um, but it, it it, there's going to be a lot of, um, I guess, shrinkage, you know, that uh, the airlines are going to limit their, you know, where they fly to. Uh, they're going to rely on more partnerships like American is now doing with JetBlue. Um, you know, things like that are going to happen. It's not the first time our, our industry has gone through, you know, a rough patch. I mean, this is more like a convulsion compared to the other challenges we faced over the last 20 years, you know, but um, I do think the entire ecosystem is, is impacted by what's going on. And, you know, getting to, uh, I think Su Suzanne's point about, you know, the transaction fees versus, you know, a different way of paying your agencies. You know, I think a lot of the agencies are, are struggling with that because they don't have the infrastructure to support a different type of payment mechanism. And that's, you know, kind of back to the same problem we're having with getting NDC content out there, you know, that the infrastructure has not been as innovative and kept up to speed as other parts of our industry. So, you know, this is a great time for all the suppliers to start focusing on, you know, innovation, technology driven solutions, becoming much more agile, you know, and, and somewhat behaving like, you know, a lot of our IT companies do, you know, so that they can, kind of adapt to this 
new dynamic environment we're going to be living in for quite some time. Very good point, Ann. Thank you. Um, so it looks like most everyone has voted on the poll and um, we got a few trickling in. It's almost a tie between we're making some changes and we're making minor adjustments. Um, we've got a couple people that we do not intend to make any changes uh, and a small amount of you where you're making significant changes but leaving a few things the same. Doesn't look like any of you are, are completely overhauling the corporate travel programs. So thank you for that feedback. I know that's something that uh, you know, a lot in the industry have been have been curious about. Um, so here's an interesting question that was posted in the chat uh, for for those travel managers who allowed Uber and Lyft and Airbnb in their programs. Have you disallowed this during COVID due to cleaning concerns, traveler health and wellness? Anybody that did allow that, but now you're kind of restricting it based on the the result of the pandemic. Um, I. For us, I think it's, well, we, we've never allowed Airbnb, so let me say that up front. Um, but for uh, Lyft or Uber, uh, we certainly allow it. Uh, it. For us, it would be, you know, whether they feel comfortable or not, you know, using it. You know, Uber and Lyft both have sent out their protocols and, you know, what they are doing for cleaning. You know, but it's it's the same thing we say with public transportation, you know, try to avoid it um, if you can. Uh, so I guess b being in a personal car is maybe safer, but um, rather than mass transit. Um, but I, 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 again, it's it's up to each each one's, you know, personal comfort level, you know, for even for us, we are working remotely. We will do so at, at least through the end of the year. Uh, when that return will be. So even being comfortable coming into the office right now is something that our travelers and our employees are, you know, they want to stay home. There are very few traveling. Um, I have traveled by air. I've traveled by car. Um, it, it, again, it's a matter of someone's comfort level as to, you know, what they want to do from an Uber standpoint or a Lyft standpoint. Most of our folks, if it is regarding you know, distance travel, if they can drive, they feel more comfortable getting a private rental car um, and then staying in a hotel versus taking the airplane where there are still, again, more people. Uh, so it's, again, uh, not to be redundant, but it is just a matter of, of personal comfort. We, also, we have in our policy, however, that anyone that does not feel comfortable traveling does not have to. And that was, that's always been there. It's not something that we had, that we just added as opposed, you know, for COVID, it was something that's always been there. If they don't feel safe, if they don't feel comfortable traveling, they're not required to do so. Sure, sure. Yeah, and it looks like, um, you know, in the chat here, uh, Carmen, you've got a lot of people that are agreeing with your, your company's stance as well. Um, you've got one comment, we allow Uber and Lyft, but are currently encouraging rental cars, you know, no Airbnb. Uh, another one, we um, have more people driving now than flying, so there's not really a huge need for rideshare. Um, and then another, uh, we have, we've never allowed Airbnb, but no restriction on Uber, so it's still an option for those employees that have essential travel they need to take. Um, so yeah, yeah. So. We're narrowing, uh, get, getting close to the end here. Um, I just want to open the floor. If anybody has anything else, um, you know, thoughts, questions, just, something to share. Yes, sir. Um, it's Karen Bond with HNTV. Okay. And hello, everybody. It's great to see so many people. I, am, I, I, I have quite a few questions, so we'll just throw them out there, and anybody who wants to answer them, great. Uh, I cannot do... Um, let's just say I can't reach out to my travelers today regarding a survey on what their temperature check is. How are they feeling? Um, what are other ways that we are able to reach out to our travelers um, to kind of see how they're feeling about travel, to get a gauge on their travel confidence? So that's one. Um, and then Red I'd trip. also like... <laughs> door to door. No? Door to door? No. <laughs> Listen, I was a telemarketer. That's a horrible idea. <laughs> They'll hang up on you. Sorry, Karen. Go ahead. <laughs> so that's one. Then another one, of course, I want to get um, 
kind of thinking about unused tickets during this time. Um, are there any creative solutions out there that we can retrieve um, some of those funds already out there? Um, what are people doing, you know, about the, the costs that's already been put out there that we aren't sure are ever going to come back in the next 12 months? Um, we're using, we've, we've managed to get, uh, most of our major cares are the ones that were using UATP cards. So, uh, we have been able to do that. It was a little tricky for us because we are billable, um, project based. Uh, it's, it's how we capture our, you know, payments from our customers and things like that. So there were some contracts that may have expired by now, or, you know, so, either letting those credits expire. So that was an option from some of our finance people. Uh, but most of us have put it on a UATP card. We worked with our uh, internal AP department and finance department to create a, an account from which those funds and credits could go that would temporarily hold there. And then our dedicated agent team is responsible for tracking those as they use them. Of course, right now, uh, we're not really doing much traveling. So we did get a two year, I think it's 2022 or something to that effect, where those funds are, um, will be, I think that's the deadline for those. Uh, we're still working through it. It is taking the airline some time to process those. So some of those have been in the work for some time now. Uh, others, one airline that we had had a rebuttal from previously has now agreed to give us the UATP. So I don't know if the airlines is now changing, you know, their mind regarding that because our premise was, hey, you're going to get this money back. I know that you need cash flow, but at the same time, you know, this is, these are funds that we have not been able to use. We may have people that are leaving the company. We don't want to have to deal with name changes and the fees that go along with the name changes and just tracking all the different travelers. So it's easier, easier for us to put it into one account and then make sure that we are, um, you know, make sure that we are putting those funds to use and that we can use them for anyone. So that's what we've done. We credited our project numbers and we put it into an account to hold until we're able to use them. And then we will track how those, are, those funds are used, you know, for the next individual that needs them. Thank you, Carmen. I appreciate that. And, and do you have all those airlines on board with that? Or is it just certain, a certain one or certain two that work? Uh, there, there were three that came through. Two, uh, one initially that was on board from the beginning. Uh, the other one... Um, and, and the one that I will say, um, they have a different model anyway. And so it was, it was a matter of just, they had credits that, you know, each, but we, what we didn't want is going back to the individual traveler as credits because these were company paid funds. And so they finally came through and said, okay, we will put these on a UATP card for you. Uh, we, ha we did have to sign agreements uh, with each of those airlines and uh, make sure that those funds were available um, you know, to us. So there was an agreement that we had to sign and given certain terms and conditions with that, with the use of those uh, UATP cards. Uh, but we have three in total. Okay, great. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. So the other thing that we looked at doing with our agency, because um, we do have one UATP card in place, and then we've got an unused ticket protocol that we're using, but we're challenging them to come up with a process where they're going to run um, ticket reports and then look at potential voids within void window and burn some unused tickets. And we're also looking, we're in a unique situation though, because we still have some essential travel that has to happen because we're an essential industry that still, you know, we still have to do drilling, right? Um, so it's not the travel we once had, but there's still a ton of travel. So we're also trying to identify certain crews that can use this, you know, these credits off the shelf um, to help keep costs low and hope, hopefully avoid some waste. It's not completely refined yet, but we are working on it with our agency. So if you haven't already done so, maybe, you know, reach out to your agency partner, because I know one of the things we challenged our agency with is what's everybody else doing? So they may be able to give you some ideas there as well. Yeah, it right. sounds like uh, okay. UATP Thanks, Holly. Hopefully is, they don't uh, charge me. <laughs> True. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah I'd just be a little careful, just throwing a word of caution out there on UATP cards. 
you just have to be a little cautious using them because they have a one year expiration date unless you've been able to negotiate something different and they may have a pretty hefty transaction fee unless you've negotiated that as well. So um, I strongly suggest you speak to your airline partners and understand the ins and outs of the UAT, UATP card as well as your agency. Yeah. Yeah, but those are negotiable right that. now. So yeah, those, those very are. good points, but everything's negotiable right now is what we're finding. Yeah, it is. And we, we were able to, like I said, extend ours, you know, well beyond one year um, because it didn't make sense. Uh, you know, you have credits. And then also we were able to include some pre-COVID uh, tickets as well. So that was a great plus for us because they included um, uh, what we did is we sent over, we get a report every we get a report every month, I believe, on all of our unused tickets. And what we did is we uploaded that log and sent over all of our unused tickets up until that point. And so we were able to get a large portion of the, that back, including um, pre-COVID tickets, uh, which we know we still can't use because they, they were expiring. So it, you're right, Anne. It is a lot uh, to do with the negotiation. Holly, you know, negotiations is open pretty much because, you know, they would rather have the, you know, gain money and keep the customers rather than to lose, lose the money, you know, from any cash flow deficits. Absolutely. Listen, everybody, we are running to the end of our time here. And uh, I feel like we're just getting going on some good topics uh, and we're right towards the end here. So should we decide to do something like this down the road, maybe I get a lot, a little more time to this. Uh, and in fact, I'm a little curious on this. So we have a lot of stuff going up in the chat. Um, if you want to, I, I encourage you to check out the chat and see how everyone's posting some of these questions. Um, one quick question, and I'd love to hear from you, uh, voice, but also in chat, uh, just real quick, do you see value in this? And is this something that you would want to see, uh, you know, more of a, an open environment where we're all talking, uh, in the future? So if you could just put a yes or a no in the chat, I'd like to see that, um, you know, or a thumbs up on your video or thumbs down. <laughs> All right, looks like we've got a lot of yes on here. And um, I was hoping that everyone would see value from this. So I'm glad you do. Um, Karen, thank you for bringing those uh, questions in. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, you had a few and I'm sorry we didn't get to all of them, but uh, I, I just wanna thank everybody for coming. Uh, before we take off, before we end this, um, I would like to turn this uh, over to our fearless leader and CEO, Andres. Uh, he's got, a special announcement for you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Justin. I just wanted to uh, audio check, make sure you guys can hear me okay. On that yes, sir. Awesome. Thank you. What an incredible discussion. Thanks to everybody for attending and sharing your collective wisdom with your colleagues, um, your willingness to ask the tough questions and just share what's working, what isn't working is really helping advance the industry. Uh, listening to your conversation today, it's, it's obvious that a lot of challenges remain. We know you guys are doing some incredibly important work. You're making tough decisions with very limited information. You're figuring out how to best keep your employees safe for those of you that are, have essential travel already occurring. And for those of you that don't, how to safely restart your programs. I did want to extend a special thank you to our fabulous uh, MC, Justin Morris. Thank you. We affectionately call him uh, JMO at uh, Traxa. So thanks for facilitating a great, really great uh, group discussion. And you're right, I think we were just kind of getting going. So we will for sure uh, do this again. My name is Andres Fabris, founder and CEO of Traxo. We care deeply about the industry. We care deeply about the safety of your travelers. Uh, we're really in awe of the important work that you're doing. And we want to make sure that we're doing our share at Traxo. We want to make sure your programs don't have any blind spots, especially in this crazy climate. We want to make sure all your travelers receive proper duty of care, that you've got all of the data, the tools, the insights to run the best possible, safest possible travel program. A lot of you have told us that you want Traxo, that you need Traxo, uh, but you're having a tough time justifying any incremental expense, obviously, in this environment. Since so few of your people are traveling, since budgets obviously remain incredibly tight. So we took that as a challenge. We pulled uh, together our team in just over a couple of days. And today we're launching a, you can think of it as a Traxo COVID special for select travel managers. So with this uh, offer, you guys will receive, can receive free use of Traxo, our full corporate product, not a slimmed down version until you have 50 or more travelers back on the road. 
And frankly, we don't care if that takes three months, six months, nine months, 12 months uh, or longer. And at the end of that time frame, there's not going to be any automatic billing that kicks in. We'll just sit down with you and determine if Traxo is right for your program. The only thing we ask you in return is that you get Traxo implemented at your company before the end of November. So we can start helping your program. You can start uh, preparing for the resumption of travel. We think that's just a fair way to let you see and experience the value firsthand. And so we're going to be releasing a little bit more detail here. Just keep an eye on your inbox for further information. So thanks again for all of the fabulous, important work that you're doing. If we can help you in any way, right? If we can help, please don't hesitate to contact and we're standing by to assist. Um, and thank you for that. Justin, back over to you. Thanks, Andres. Um, yeah, I mean, just to reiterate that, uh, you guys, we sincerely want to be of help and we want to make it easy to do business with. So I hope you will take that into consideration. And if you would like to learn more about how Traxxas can help your organization uh, to eliminate corporate travel booking blind spots and for a personal virtual tour of our services, uh, you may request an overview at the link we're posting in the chat and uh, as well as on Traxxas.com. And again, as we mentioned earlier, if you would like for us to facilitate any connections between you, uh, you know, you'd like to uh, get connected with someone who made a comment um, or had a question, you'd like to help them with that question, please feel free to reach out to me direct, justin.morris at traxo.com, and I'll do everything I can to get you connected. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much for coming. Look forward to seeing you on the next one. Take care. Thank you.